And we're back. Welcome to Abstractable. This is a podcast for the entrepreneurial spirited, the curious, the hungry people, and those wanting to learn about new and interesting things. We distill the best ideas from the world's best thinkers in business, startups, psychology, sports, arts, you name it. And in today's episode, we talk about the documentary Exit Through the Gift Shop by Banksy. And we discuss Banksy and the movement of street art. We talk about how the character of Mr. Brainwash came to be and how it relates to mastery and creativity. We chat about what art is, what defines its value, and how to determine what the next big thing will be. So why art? We're fascinated by it. We're in the theme of art at the moment, and we think the world is better off as a result of it, so everyone should have a little bit of it in their daily lives. And we do want to find out if the outcome of this film is because it's art itself or if it's a critique on the world of art. So don't forget, you can find full video from our episodes on YouTube. And if you like today's episode, we would seriously appreciate you to share it with someone else. Thank you. We hope you enjoy the episode. Relevant to a couple of episodes ago, Bezos uh, wrote his final shareholders letter. Did you see that? Is it out? Is it out? out. It is out. And you've read it? Find it online. I have read it, yes. So he says as he's as he's googling it. Jeff going to Bezos let uh, to share. <laughs> I I did read some of it. I have to admit I didn't finish it. There you go. That's the truth. Okay. Is it is it the most enlightening of all of them, or is it? Uh, he's tra- he's sort of writing his legacy piece, you know. Ah uh, yes, this is this is. I, I've I've been reading a couple of political books recently, mate, and. Um, I'm finding that the 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 you know the kind of autobiography written you know by the retired politician is like the setup of the legacy. It's oh, like this absolutely. is how I this is how I want to be remembered. Absolutely. None of that other stuff that went on. And this is my final say on all those issues now that no one can argue back to me. <laughs> yeah. Them. Yeah, that's it. No, they're definitely uh, writing their own legacy there for sure. Um, have you? Because you're reading Malcolm Turnbull's book. Is that a future episode for us? I think so. I think yeah. there's a lot of interesting discussion in there. Um, okay. okay. I've also read Obama's recently. Well, we did record an episode about that. Yeah. So. Yeah. And the other one was um, Keating. Did you? Going back a few years. Right. No, I'm right. just just getting it just getting into that. So cool. Uh, that's gonna be that's gonna be a, a step back into the time machine. But okay, so you d- to you've delved into the politics. So is there any reason? No, mate. It's just uh I don't know. Ever since we did the uh, Obama one, it was just an interesting take. And I thought, well, <laughs> why am I reading so much about bloody American politics? Why don't I read a couple of Australian Good you know, call. Good call. Political summations and show a little bit of patriotism, you know. <laughs> well, it is like closer to home, isn't it? So, it well, is it's a lot liter- closer to home, literally. Isn't it? Yeah. So, that's uh, pretty interesting. But we're diving back into art today. You know, the arty scene. The we arty follow scene. our nose, don't we? Like, once we get a hold of something, we'll uh, we'll keep going until we try to understand a bit more about it. <laughs> Have so so Locke, have we uh, have we progressed any further along the uh, the journey of art since we started it? A tiny bit, but probably not not much. But who you know, who really knows anything about it versus who says they do? Well, this is the thing. In um, you've seen that. I don't know if we've spoken about it on here as yet, but there's that documentary on Netflix called mm. Sour Grapes. Have we touched on that? No, already? I haven't watched it. I haven't watched it. Oh, it's a it's an absolute classic. Um, and, and I know, it's that, just a I bit, know that it's about like fake wine, right? Yeah, it just epitomizes what you just said about art. And it's like, is it really uh, about the art or is it kind of, 
part and parcel the art and you know who it's around with and you know um the kind of context in which the audience is partaking in whatever it is uh as well as the salesmanship of the whole whole bloody thing so effectively i'm not going to spoil too much about it for you because i actually want you to watch it um maybe it could be a I think it would be a part kind of we could put it together in a bit of a multi a multi session somewhere I, somehow. I tell you I'll tell you what we should put it with. There's one about fake um paintings on Netflix as well. Okay. Um, have you seen that? I have. So we okay. could do the trade I haven't, and kind of talk to trade. those ones. That that would be quite cool. All right. That might be a nice way to actually round off this uh this little art art fetish that we seem to be having at the moment mate. yeah close it out with some forgery i like it yeah uh what are we talking about today what's the uh what's the topic so today is a documentary called exit through the gift shop now when you first told me about this i had a completely different idea about what this was going to be. For some reason, I thought this was going to be a documentary about the solar system or something like that. I don't know why I had that in my head. Um, <laughs> okay. It just had, it just had um, Neil deGrasse Tyson or something written all over, you know, just some obscure name that really has nothing to do with this, you know, the solar system but, you know, end up tying it all back to that we live in a gift shop or something, the simulation <laughs> gift shop. Um, so, no, um, this is... A film, uh, well, let's say related to Banksy for now. Um, we can dive into that. And it's a film that was uh, pulled together by um, a guy named uh, Thierry Guetta. And this is a journey of him filming Banksy and then maybe not filming Banksy. So... Mm. Um, maybe, maybe to kind of elucidate a little bit more there, mate, maybe you can tell us about who the hell Banksy is. Very difficult because he is an anonymous artist, but I think everyone has heard of Banksy, right? Like you would have had to be living in or under a rock not to, I think. But Banksy effectively is a pseudonym for a street artist with an unknown identity. And he's been making art on the streets of the world since around 1990. And while he's done well to conceal his identity, it's commonly believed that he's Robert Gunningham. But no one really knows. So, But Robin was born in 28th of July, 1973. In 2000... Sorry, mate. That's a really interesting one. And, and you know what's even better now? We've got no lag between us. So I can just jump in whenever I just want. Just interrupt uh, whenever you need to, yeah. Um, so the best bit about that kind of bio is we normally launch straight into like it's it's almost a cadence to launch you into their you know, date of birth, whereas in this case we genuinely can't do it uh, because no one really knows who this guy is. Yeah, which is pretty cool. I love that. Um. In 2003, a friend described Banksy as a white guy, 28, scruffy casual jeans, T-shirt, a silver tooth, a silver chain and a silver earring. (laughs) That's pretty cool. And he looks a bit like Mike Skinner from the streets for anyone who's a fan of that uh, English spoken rap or from back in the 2000s. (laughs) Sorry, what, what is that? The streets. Yeah. It's it's a band or I suppose a group where this like sort of English guy kind of like talks in a very, it's not quite rap. It's kind of like he almost just talks in a really strong English accent. It got quite popular. Like uh, a Cockney accent or something? Yeah, you know that yeah. Real. Love it. Yeah. So, um, but what we do know about Banksy is his art, you know. So he has made... A lot of art, a lot of art. Um, And I guess, you know, it's kind of characterised by, you know, these kind of images he puts up and the way he kind of is playful with his uh, themes and that sort of thing. But he started freehanding with freehand graffiti um, in Bristol in the UK. But by 2000 he turned to the art of stenciling. 
Um, and the story is that he realised how much less time it took to complete a work while stenciling and graffiti or street art is illegal. And the story, possibly apocryphal, that he says is he claims that he changed to stenciling because while he was hiding from the police under a, a rubbish truck and he noticed the stenciled serial number of 30, 36 or something and by employing, you know, like the na- number of the truck, and then he employed this technique and soon became much wide, more widely recognised because he could do a lot of interesting stuff and a lot of preparation for it. So maybe, mate, just as a nice little uh, explanation there, the stenciling is basically like cutting out stuff from like cardboard or paper and then laying that down or sticking it against the surface and then Banksy's really renowned for the black, the black paint that he uses maybe you know um highlighted with a bit of white maybe but you know the classic one is where he's uh was it was in israel on the wall uh the, you know the wall that's uh, between there and palestine and there's the the girl with the balloons um that's kind of lifting her above the wall mm. is probably yeah. one of the most famous for the famous ones is that yeah and i guess he also uses stencils but also like he actually glues things onto the wall. I don't know what you call that, um, but, you know. Gluing. Gluing stuff, yeah. That's the technical term. Um, so but his what makes him famous is his sort of playful images, you know. They're very clever the way that he kind of communicates something um, and you kind of need to look it up. You probably already know this if you're listening, but. He has generally a sort of anti-war themes or anti-establishment stuff or he's poking fun at something or capitalism or something and he uses a lot of like uh, there's a lot of rats that he uses in his work. And, but he's been making this stuff forever and he, he became really famous for it. Now there are hundreds of pieces of art but a couple of the key ones are, you know, he did a lot of stuff around the Gaza Strip like you said Um which was kind of controversial. Uh, and in 2018, he one of his works, by this stage it was so, you know, it was wildly popular and it sold at an auction at Sotheby's in London uh, for a million pounds, it's about three million bucks. Does and he as soon get as, that million, million pound? Like, yeah. But who receives the money if no one knows who it is? Oh, I assume there's ways and means, Ron. You're a clever well, guy. Well, no, yeah, that's true. Some, I Is mean, that what other people, for? <laughs> yeah, other people on sell his work, right? right? So if you bought one, you could sell it later. But yeah, um, anyhow, he trusted, trusted inner circle members. Yeah, so the gavel drops and it's sold, and an alarm sounded inside the picture frame, and it started shredding the art, which of course made it even more valuable. Um, and he posted it on Instagram saying, going, going, gone. So it was obviously one of his associates was there probably, perhaps him himself. So super playful, super clever, but he made this movie that we're talking about or this documentary, Exit Through the Gift Shop, uh, and it first aired on the, in 2010 at the Sundance Film Festival. And in late January 2011, it was nominated for an Oscar. So not just a talented street artist can make a pretty good film too. And this is what he said about the, um, the nomination. This is a big surprise. I don't agree with the concept of award ceremonies, but I'm prepared to make an exception for ones I'm nominated for. The last time there was a naked man covered in gold paint in my house, it was me. So he's just like got a sense of humour, this fella. So. Pretty funny. Yeah, he's a classic. He's, he's like, you know, classic like uh, when you hear him talk on the on the documentary, it's like they've, they've distorted his voice a little bit but his accent is so thick that, you know, you can't mistake that kind of laddie cockney accent as I mentioned before. It's just, it's, it's unreal. And you so, can get a picture of what he's like through what he says. Yeah, yeah, and it's so interesting how he's able to communicate so effectively and no one knows who he is, <laughs> you know. So 
it's interesting to be able to become that famous anonymously. So uh, <laughs> I, I mentioned before, mate, that, you know, the the film was kind of supposed to be, be about Banksy, but you find out that it actually was made by Banksy. Um, so who is the film about? The film, well, that's an interesting question. But what I will say is that if you haven't seen the movie the movie, and you want to avoid any spoilers, now is the time to shut this off and go and watch it. You can find it on YouTube. Didn't hear that here. Um, or you can rent it. And from now on we're going to be talking about the movie in more detail. So We so, don't normally give disclaimers to mate, so that's very Yeah. Common. Yeah, look, but you know, I feel like the spoiler thing it's not really required for a movie that came out in two thousand ten. But, you know, we're good people, so we'll we'll do that. Imagine um, imagine doing that for like I don't know, the sound of music. Don't want to spoil <laughs> the end of the sound of music. Spoilers. But they make it to Austria. <laughs> yeah. So, well, the movie's about Banksy, but it's actually about the, this guy called Thierry Guetta. Um, now, according, when we meet Thierry, he is the proprietor of a used clothing store in Los Angeles and he's French and he films himself everywhere he goes. So he's effectively a videographer who just started filming everything he did. And one day he went out and met, went around with his cousin and his cousin is another French guy who is a famous street artist named Invader and you may have seen his work where he makes pixelated mosaics that look a little bit like Space Invader and other things. Uh or the, um, the little monsters from Space Invader. And then he started filming the exploits of his cousin. And, you know, for these street artists, that was pretty cool because often the work doesn't last or it's destroyed. There's no real, you can't sort of show it off, you know. And street art was relatively unknown at that time. So then he starts getting really into this and this is kind of the starts to be the topic of the movie is that he meets a bunch of famous famous street artists and later to become very famous and starts filming them and he says he's going to make a documentary about all these artists and one of those is Banksy and the movie the film kind of goes from there now for us to talk about it we probably need to just bring this right through and just explain what happens Ryan well, um, just just on that, mate, he, because he was in this circle of um, these street artists that started with his cousin who was quite famous already, there was just, he always wanted to meet Banksy, always wanted to film for Banksy because he'd just been doing this for years. He'd, he'd essentially given away his shop uh, and everything else associated with his shop and just was doing this and nothing else. So um, that's a good point is that he just got so obsessed with filming this street art. He'd just stay out all night following these guys around and filming them and being their accomplices. Yeah, and he became like he became not just the, you know, this weird guy that just follows you around and films you all night. Uh, because there's a few like obscure moments where he's just like filming people and they're like, why the fuck are you filming me? Um, yeah, and this this is before the days of, you know, iPhones and everyone having an iPhone and recording everything that's going on around them. This is this is like pretty pretty early on. It was a new, a new feeling and concept to be filmed out in public for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so all he wanted to do across a number of years was to meet Banksy and it just was just happenstance, which we'll get into later, that uh, for some reason Banksy had to come into his area uh, or into you know his city and um, s- someone, he asked someone who asked someone, do you know someone that can point me in the direction of where to go or what to do here? Uh, and it just so happened that the man in the know was Mr. Guetta himself. 
And so he was fortunate enough to get to meet Banksy, show him around, and then suggested uh, that he was making a documentary about all of these street art artists that he's, you know, that he's been uh, filming across all these years. And that was enough to go for Banksy to go, oh, you know, look, I'm anonymous, but happy for happy to be involved in this in this project of yours. And you know, as the story goes, little did Banksy know that this was just a load of shit. All that uh, Guetta had really done, he'd just been filming stuff. He'd never looked at the films. He'd never <laughs> made record of what was on the films. They were just a bunch of tapes sitting in a bunch of rooms on a bunch of shelves in his in his house. Um, it was just chaos. They'd never Is been, it- and they'd basically never been watched back, as, as far as I could discern. Yeah, it's like, how weird is that, right? But I guess he just wanted to kind of hang out with these guys and the the rush of going around and watching them work and all that kind of stuff, you know. Well, this is this is quite interesting because effectively all he is is he's just a groupie, but because he's got a video camera in hand people think there's some legitimacy to what he's doing and therefore, oh, you know, he's our videographer guy. He's, he's making a documentary about us and then all of a sudden he's got an air of credibility around him that he's the videographer guy and then all of a sudden, you know, he's on a platform to jump from to then eventually find his way meeting Banksy and filming Banksy. Um, there's, there's something strange in that. So that's a very like fake it till you make it but I don't even think he was faking it till he made it. I think he was just, he's just a strange dude. Just, just like the film things. Fuck, just an obsessive guy. So it gets to the point. I, cha- the I, cha- I, I challenge you here, though, mate. Right? I, I mentioned the iPhone world that we live in now. I see people, myself included, taking photos all the time, taking videos all the time. Have you actually ever gone back and looked at? Well, I've probably looked at some, but Not certainly really. I'm never no. going to see any of the, all those photos ever again. Uh, well, that's true, but it's kind of like there's doing that once in a while and once a day, twice a day and filming every fucking thing you do, right? I don't know. I feel like there's, I feel like, uh, it's a fine there's line. plenty of that that all, goes on. We've all kind of <laughs> headed there already, yeah, perhaps. Well, uh, well you, look at the, you look at all the like the story, you know, instant video apps. I'm starting to sound like a bloody old fogey talking like this. But, you know, Snapchat, Instagram stories, Twitter, uh, fleets or whatever they are, and um, TikTok. It's all what's, like what's everything fleets? that's going on. It's just like Twitter's version of stories, right? Or a tic, you know, Twitter's TikTok. I don't think anyone okay. uses it. Right. Um, that's why you don't know about it. And so, uh, you know, that's like that's everyone's lives on show. Yeah, I mean, you're right, it's kind of heading that way, isn't it? So maybe it's not as extreme as we think. But uh, nonetheless, at some point someone goes to Thierry, hey, mate, where's this film? You know, can't wait to see it. I think it, it was and Banksy. He, yeah, he's <laughs> like, well, I want to see this film. And he, and he's at this point he goes away for a few months and comes back with a first cut of the film and it is just the biggest piece of shit that anyone's seen, it's the weirdest thing. And then I think Banksy says, look, at this point I kind of realised that Thierry was a bit a bit nuts, you know. And so I think I think I think he I think he said it was about 30 seconds into this film <laughs> that I realised that Thierry was off his head. Like <laughs> and, and they show a portion of this film that he creates and it's just like like screeching and then you know shortcuts of all these different you know, various random videos, some street artists, some just complete random bullshit uh, thrown in there with these really loud sound effects and things and cut scenes. It was just, <laughs> you can imagine sitting there for like an hour, hour, hour and a half of that, just like gradually winding up in intensity across the entire film. Uh, it would be yeah. like, a, it would be a nightmare. It's a nightmare. Um, and so... At this point in time, street art is hot, you know. It is piping hot. Uh, and Banksy's done his first big show and he's everyone's selling pieces for 
you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars at this point. And so Banksy sort of says, just to get get Thierry the hell away from him, he says, oh, can you go back to uh, Los Angeles and just start playing around making some art, you know. And, you know, Thierry being completely obsessed with Banksy saw this as his mission, you know. And so he goes back to Los Angeles and creates the biggest compilation of art that you could possibly pump out. You know, he's making 15 pieces a day. He's like, you know, hired, he's remortgaged his house, he's hired all these people to uh, make art for him, you know. He's basically just ripping it straight out of books and he calls starts calling himself Mr Brainwash. And this is kind of where it starts to get really weird and you realise that the story's not really about Banksy, it's kind of about this guy who's become this overnight street artist. Yeah. Well, it's at this point that uh, Banksy goes. Um, so, you know, I realised this guy was nuts. Um, so I proposed to him that he goes and makes art and I'll actually pull the film together. Uh, and so then the, then the documentary became about Thierry and kind of just goes full 180 uh, back onto the, the videographer and – it gets to the the launch of this thing, and you know it's absolute chaos. You know, they're, they're, it seemed like they were probably a couple of hours out from the event. He's got about ten thousand pieces of art that he needs to put out in this exhibition. So he's and putting he hasn't on got a yeah. one out. So he's putting on. He puts on an exhibition. Yeah. So he puts on. Sorry, it's probably that. the bit we missed. Yeah. He he goes. I'll put on an exhibition. He gets a quote from Banksy. He gets a quote from Shepherd Fairy, who he knows and starts to build a shitload of hype around this. And and then people turn up and they like they love it, you know? And little do they know he's just a madman who's just <laughs> scribbling randomly on stuff or he's got like a book of art and he's just taken you know old uh versions of warhols and stuff and like sprayed something on top of them or whatever, you know, like and people are just loving it, you know, and he starts selling them for 50, 80,000 and all this sort of stuff. And this is kind of the point of the documentary where it's sort of like this guy kind of created himself and everyone just bloody loved it. And oh, the, 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 best, the, best, the best bit was if you were one of the first like 50 people through the door, you got your own unique, um, you know, Thierry piece or brainwash piece. Right, and he basically lines up fifty prints. By that point in time, he'd broken his legs, so he's getting wheeled around in a wheelbarrow or some weird. No, he had a weird scooter thing that he was riding around on, and he just lines them all up beside each other and just pours paint on them uh, as he's riding past. Uh, and those were the the fifty pieces of, of of art, and they probably weren't too too far different from the uh, the other pieces that were a part of the show. So. I guess this is the point that Banksy's kind of trying to get to is like, what is this? What the hell does this mean? What does it mean for my art? What does it mean for art in general that this guy could just go basically make a bunch of shit up that didn't mean anything, not even to him, and create some sort of hype machine to sell and people really enjoy the art? So is it art? Look. Yes. Yes, it is. And why do you say that? Because it may not be good, but it's this. It has an impact on people. So, therefore, it is an artwork. Mm. And I think it's an expression. Like it's it's the way I see it is it's a very real representation of this dude his art is totally fucking chaotic like it's it's basically yeah as you say a printed copy of some other famous piece of art or slightly modified other piece of art from an art book and then he just splashes some shit on it and then puts it on the wall and you know it's like chaos and i just feel like his art and what you see in it is a representation of what's going on in his head 
uh, or the, the the character that is him uh, in this film. It feels very not very genuine. The art he's making. It feels mass produced. Certainly. But I where, don't know. where Warhol was doing that, you know, that was the point of it. It had a point, you know. Whereas for him, the point was to sell a bunch of paintings. And that is not an artistic point. It's just mm. so like that's where it gets that's where the greyness comes in, you know. And then, you know, that kind of idea that we talked about in one of our other episodes is like how much of the artist's intention is important versus what does it what it makes people feel when they go because they all a lot of people went to the show and really loved it Mm. so Banksy was clearly trying to say that I think that 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 it I think at one point he says I don't even know what I'm trying to say but but I think the tone is that this kind of is bullshit and it delegitimizes the work of real artists. Mm. Do you think, well, maybe, and, and I don't know, maybe maybe it's the classic metric of time. Uh, you know, if we're still talking about Mr. Brainwash in 30, 50 years' time, maybe he was the, uh, the innovative artist uh, that we just didn't see at the time, uh, whereas, you know, Maybe we won't be talking about him in 30 to 50 years' time. Mm. So the standing of the test of time is, is probably a big, a big piece here. But in order to stand the test of time, I think you actually need a platform from which to stand to begin with. So that's the hype factor I think that you're talking about. So maybe, maybe there's something in that about you need to create the platform so that you can be seen at the time that, you know, the time of the art, the time of the existence of it. Uh, But depending on your art, um, maybe that's what helps it kind of persist. Persistence of memory, if I want to be Mm. a little bit punny there. It's an interesting point. You know, the other interesting thing is like the level of excitement around street art at that time was like peak and that kind of helped his art along and gave it its own mystique as well, you know. So, you know, he, yeah, he certainly timed it right. And I guess it kind of is an interesting thing to talk about as well as like catching a wave, you know. He jumped on this obscure thing following these guys around who were doing something pretty weird and esoteric and over the period of 10 years, it became hugely popular, and by that time he was right in the right in the thick of it. Yeah, well, I guess I guess you can look at the you know many of the abstract, like the the very abstract uh, art pieces when they first came out, and you've got a big you know big wide canvas with half of it blue, half of it white, and yeah, you know, that's the piece, and. Someone looks at it and goes, I could have done that. Well, you didn't <laughs> is probably the point. Um, and that's the, you you know, usually it's a sign of the times and what is innovating in, in this space um, in order to get it there. Yeah. the It's like not to be understated how big Mr. Brainwash got. He did a, a cover for a Madonna album. Um, you know, he did all sorts of famous stuff like with. And, and and for me, mate, that's like the most famous Madonna album cover. It's the first one I think of if I think of a Madonna cover album. So the chances are if you, if you can, if you know any Madonna album covers, it's the one you're thinking of. <laughs> and, you know, this is the woman who dated Basquiat, like, and now she's dealing with old Mr. Brainwash, you know, like. <laughs> So, so, mate. Um, so here's here's a really <clears throat> okay. So the film the film won an award, uh, the Oscar. 
And so obviously the film... It didn't, it didn't win I, the Oscar. It got nominated. Sorry, nominated for the Oscar. So in, its, in itself, you know, the film is certainly a piece of art. Uh, we're portraying an artist or a supposed artist in the film. And the reason I say supposed artist is because there's also talk, and you may not know this, that the entire character was a fictional character made up by Banksy to discuss the idea of art in this documentary. I did read this. I didn't know this until I was looking, doing some research for this episode. Now, that is super interesting. I think over time that's borne out to be incorrect, but, like, that's the level of, like, mystique around Banksy, isn't it? Like, my gut feel is that he got a whiff of this guy being a real weird, like, just a special unit and used his <laughs> used his influence and stuff to kind of create this monster on purpose. I think he probably did that, you know. To I almost put, wouldn't put that past him that he did that to kind of make the point in the first place. Yeah, he's probably taken his artistic liberty in the creation of the film, no doubt. What do you think? Do I think it's a conspiracy? Do I think yeah. it's nothing? How much was? How much of it was kind of orchestrated? Do you think? Well, it's hard to know because. You know, there's been some like journalist institutions that have come out, you know, and done pieces around that it, that it is nothing but a fiction. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, this Mr. Brainwash guy, well, I haven't seen him in person, but supposedly he exists. So, you know, I, I, I suspect it's a case of artistic license. Is, he's is still, hunch. yeah, he's still making art now. So, he's he, he all right, so here's the conspiracy on it. Is is this guy just a guy that's been one of Banksy's like inner circle for just a number of years? And Banksy's gone, mate. Do you want to be catapulted out into the, out into the uh, absolute stardom? And he's gone, yeah, I'm in. And then they go, all right, this is how we're going to do it. Mm, that I, that I could get behind. Mm. There we go. Conspiracy for the episode. Yeah. So yeah. taking it that, that it's not a conspiracy, mate, right? Mr. Brainwash. He's so got this, a really interesting thought uh, about him here well, and, and his thought process. The, the, well, the film is like set up to kind of make fun of this guy or in a way or set him up as a bit of a fall guy or <laughs> the butt of a joke or something, you know. Because he is so wild. But, you know, really he's got all the traits to become very good at something. And it brought me back to the creative curve. And if you look him up now, the stuff that he's making is actually pretty intricate and not bad. It's certainly a lot better than his first stuff. Um, So he's actually turned himself into quite a good artist. Whether it's got much depth through or not, but technically he can. He made this giant Kobe mural and a few other things like that were actually pretty cool. You um, reckon he's making NFTs, mate? Probably, probably. Um, and so, just to back over the creative curve, this is kind of like the four laws of creativity that um, Alan Garnett wrote in his book when he studied a lot of people who had done some cool stuff creatively, and. The first law is consumption. So you need to get a feel for what's popular creativity. You need to immerse yourself in the chosen field. Well, tick, the guy spent years following street artists, as many as he could find around and documenting what they were doing. And and if only he went home of a night time and then watched what he had recorded <laughs> that day, because then he would have been the he would have been doing nothing but consuming <laughs> yeah. his craft. Um, then law two is imitation. Learn from the masters. All artists and great creators have done this. So learn from the best and immerse yourself Mate, in do, a do, world do, where they are. Do, 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 hang on. If, just going back on that, in that, in that kind of consumption rule, there's that talk about like three to four hours of consumption a day. And he was like spending 
eight plus hours yeah. every single night, totally immersed, probably more than this throughout the day. Plus he had his like this videography kind of piece going on all the other time that he was awake where he was, I don't know if he was really trying to frame up a perspective or something in the, you know, in the frame of the, the film or not, but he's, he's in that. Like he's totally, totally immersed in it. So he's well and truly getting his three or four hours. Yeah. And, yeah, it's so interesting because he's definitely just in that world. He's amongst the best in the world. He's following Shepard Thierry around who made that Obama poster and, you know, going with him night after night to, to do this stuff and seeing his creative process. He's hanging out with Banksy, for God's sake, the greatest living street artist. Yeah, so, the Bay guy. Yeah. <laughs> so, it out by him. Yeah, so he's just absolutely you know surrounded by greatness basically and so that's kind of like he can imitate those masters but then he also covers him for law three which is be part of a creative community get people around you that are also creators and you really need a master teacher a, a sort of muse and a and a collaborator as well so and you need a promoter I mean, tick, tick, tick for him. And then last one is that he iterate. So always be working on your art, always do that. And once he starts something, this guy, Thierry, he becomes obsessed by it. So once he started making art, he was making art for hours every day. It may not have been good, but he was iterating the hell out of it. So it's actually, he's actually got all the all the traits that make you very good at something, which is not really what you kind of see firsthand out of the movie until you think about it a bit more. So that's my contrarian take on on old Mr. Brainwash. I, I love it, and I I reckon it. Yeah, you know, maybe we maybe we're um, on our oversensitive pattern recognition mode, but mate, I'm I'm into that. I really like this uh, the piece about the Law Four iteration too. Uh, you are not your art. And you kind of mentioned before that you didn't feel like he was maybe genuine. I'd maybe see that as though, you know, if someone like pissed on his on his art, he probably wouldn't care. He'd be like, great, move on. I've already done I've already done the sixty other pieces in the last two hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like he's just an art machine, this guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh. And uh, so, mate, the, the, like probably the biggest thing that's driven all of that is that he's just nothing but obsessed and he was nothing but obsessed and then he essentially pursued that to no other end. Yeah. So much so that when, you know, he got <laughs> he got given the, uh, you know, handed down the tablet from, from, from the man himself, uh, Banksy, to say go off and create my son he you know he's he remortgaged his house his family house now i think that's pretty extreme uh however you know it really shows that he was he was committed he was going for broke he was gonna make it happen imagine being married to this guy holy shit well that's the thing is he was never home and he was always like seemingly on the other side of the world as well, like travelling around, not just doing that in, in his home city, but he was travelling all over the place with all these all these artists. It's unbelievable. Mm. But he, he he was either he either had money, he was being spotted the whole time, or I don't know, he's just able to get by on essentially nothing. Uh, I couldn't quite work that out. But he... Wasn't in it for certainly for the coin. He was just in it for, you know, satisfying his interests. Um, and what he did is pursue the associations that he had and the networks and building them up. What this, what it felt like for me, mate, when I first saw him, was: Have you seen the movie American Beauty? Yeah, ah, uh, a long time. I'm not sure. It's got Kevin Spacey, isn't it? Doesn't it? It does, yeah. Kevin Spacey, but it's, no, I don't think I've actually seen it. No, I think of it. it's a it's a good film. It is a good film, uh, creepy film, but good film. And 
another classic just you know critique of society and anyway there's a there's this really strange unit in this uh yeah, it probably has some similarities, but he's a much more like reserved and quiet character as opposed to being this like totally obnoxious and just in your face character like Mr. Brainwash, uh, who goes around filming things as well. And he's just like one day he's filming a plastic bag just like swirling up in the wind and, you know, he was just taken away by it. And yeah, you know, he had his um he had his girlfriend there who's one of the main characters in the film, and you know, she's taken away by the fact that this guy, this artist, this videographer is filming this thing and just thinks that is so cool, he is so cool and the, all, you know, all the worlds combined, mate. So a lot of like parallels for me uh, to that that level of obsession to the point that no one else really cares uh, or sorry, to the, to the point where you don't really care what anyone else thinks uh, about what it is that you're doing. So mm. the other thing I had here was it is like that classic saying of the harder you work, the luckier you get. Yeah. Because this guy was just, he was immersed. He was, you couldn't be kicking up more dust than what this guy was kicking up on, on a daily basis. And creating a you dust know? storm, this guy, yeah, seriously. And every single one of those, you know, bits of dust was a, a, a chance at just finding another connection, meeting someone else, encountering a weird situation that just, ends up going to some you know, extraordinary place and you know effectively that is what ended up happening at the coalescing of all these bits of dust uh, to the to the meat of of Banksy so it, it was almost like he was just playing the ground for connections he was doing like the internship you know for for a number of years there and just getting himself on a platform that he could really launch from later on yeah now he's rich well, maybe he's, maybe he's a, you know, a visionary. He's a strategic. He was strategic the entire time. And, it was you know, that kind of masquerade that he had as being a videographer was all just part of the, part of the story, part of the think, strategy. Yeah, it's kind of a good thing. It's like a good example of like do something for free if you love it and you think, you know. This is, this is it, mate. Give back. Give back. Yeah. Uh, it's strange what comes back when you give when you give to something, particularly so, you know something that you're interested in. Therefore, you, know, you, you you're going to give it a go. You're going to enjoy doing it yourself. You probably yeah. go back and do it again. Uh, there's there's something about that. Uh, I you know I'm I'm not I'm not going to kind of point it on good karma, but there's there's something in that. You know. Yeah. What's the um? What is the takeaway from uh, from this? That Banksy kind of just to close out on Thierry. What's your takeaway from this watching this film? There's something extremely fascinating about this movie. What is it that's so that you take away from it if you're going to distill it down? Honestly, mate, it's it's pursue your passion. But I think more so than that is if you go before that pursuing of the passion, it's like he was just had this weird quirk, this guy, about filming things. And so he started filming things. And so he enjoyed, he just re, he recognized that it was something that he enjoyed. So he started getting involved in it more. He started finding out other ways that he could express that or do that or get involved in that. And, and, it just kind of steps its way along. And I think, you know, I think that can be applied to anything really. You know, if you're a, if you're a surfer, I'm sure you could do the same thing. You just go find different breaks. If you're really obsessed, you can go on a holiday and go surfing in famous beaches around the world. Um, you've obviously got to have a level of skill so that you don't get totally, so you don't break your back uh, or worse. But, you know, there's there's something in that. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Like, if you kind of push hard enough into something, you'll find some way to make it work. Perhaps you yeah. can't be like too obsessed with money or something like that, but you'll find a you'll find a way to kind of make something of it. 
I mean, this kind of follow your passion thing is a tricky, nuanced piece mm. of advice, but mm-hmm. in this instance, it seems to be true in some way because I don't think he really cared too much until he started making this art, whether he was going to be successful or not. Um, and and that's the question I've got is I wonder, you know, fast forward to today from, you know, when the film first started, if he was still just running around after all these graffiti artists still doing the same thing, I could probably see him still doing that. I don't know, you know. Yeah, me too. Um, and so he probably – and he probably would just be enjoying it just as much. And so I think that's the the kind of bit there is – you'd have to be comfortable with that as a, as a result. And, and probably the reality is if you were giving that even a bit of thought, the chances you probably, you probably don't fit in that bracket, <laughs> you know, because the, because the passion isn't compelling enough. Mm. The, the one other thing, mate, uh, that I did want to touch on uh, was about this c- you mentioned at the very start of the, the show that like street art being illegal and street art was always that, yeah, it was very like vandalism type, you know, very, uh, you know, almost rudimentary in, in, it, in, its, in its early early days, very tag orientated uh, as opposed to other things. Whereas you see the kind of continual evolution as a result of some of these, you know, really big street artists now, mm. it's completely evolved into something else and it's incredible. So much so that it's like now an encouraged thing, like the city of Melbourne creates graffiti, well, many cities do this, but you know, just pointing to one example, we create graffiti walls for people to create murals and redo things that are dilapidated or whatever and actually cover them up with with nice looking art and things and, and it's great. It's pretty it's awesome. Really, really like it's pretty primal to paint on something that's just there, isn't it? Like it's very human. It is, um, it is. There was one there was one when we were uh when we were living in France and I actually think um Invader may have also been from Lyon or nearby. Cool. Uh, I, I think he was I think he was French at least. But there was a there's a um, guy there called M and M Flacking, and it's a very similar like mosaic thing to the Invader guy. Okay. But what he does is goes around and basically fills in potholes or fills in cracks oh, in the paint. And I've in, seen in, this. in France, there is a fuckload of that um, everywhere. And so he just he like just fills these things in with mortar and and then pr- does a proper job of filling them in, but. Some of the mosaics are excellent. Like they really, really look good. And you just ah. you're walking down the street and you just all of a sudden stumble across one. I'm Although just you don't stumble you, you don't yeah. stumble anymore because there used to be a pothole there, but now there isn't. I just um Googled it. It's pretty awesome, isn't it? It is. It's really, really cool. Yeah. Really cool stuff. And there's some some yeah, you know, some decent size ones and some in really obscure places like <laughs> On, on main motorways and things. It's just, um, it's very Amazing. cool. Yeah, what a great very idea. Very interactive. It's always present. So where's it going next, do you think? Well, one thing that I um, did also notice, the so the Space Invader stuff, there's a, an app called Flash Invader and you can kind of go around and snap up all the <laughs> all the Space Invaders around the world. We've got a friend who's you know, almost clocked the bloody thing. Uh, it's almost like you know, being gamified to, That's you know, pretty cool. to go back to the Space Invader game. So it's like, well, maybe it's like catching a Pokemon or something. And so, you know, that's a real that's a real kind of new form digital marketing ploy for that artist though, you know, to, to try and get some exposure and, and stuff. So... Yeah, we're seeing we're seeing new forms of art take hold. We're seeing NFTs, um, non fungible tokens, you know, be used to sell and trade art. Um, now that's a really interesting concept. I, you know, and that's obviously going to give give way to the real trading now of video art. I think I think videos 
going to increasingly rise um, as an art form. Uh, yeah, that yeah. seems to be true as the price of screens drops seems to be the way it's going, doesn't it? Yeah. I've, well, I've, I used to hate, I, I used to not stand video art. Um, I, I've been to a few um, museums that just had essentially so- showcases with video artists and I think I've come full circle, mate. There's some really, you know, it's usually very weird, very esoteric, quirky stuff, um, stuff that trips you out or is just, totally obscene but there's some interesting stuff in in there you know it's um you haven't seen it's a, a form lot of, of it, expression i'm sure i'm sure it is so, yeah. i'm keen to see what what's coming next <laughs> any any predictions from you mate whilst we're making predictions i probably don't know enough about it but you know i think street art's going nowhere you know like as we, uh, as, as it is not going to disappear, you mean? <laughs> yeah, like uh, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> that could be misinterpreted. It's not going to disappear. We're urbanizing so much more, you know. Like I feel like using the built environment to communicate is becoming more. It may not be the hot thing, but it's it's going to be around for ages, and it's probably the the biggest exposure I have to like painting style art is street art in my life because you just see it. Um, that's one of the cool things about it, I think. So, I, I totally agree, mate. And to be honest, you know, as we move into this increasingly digitised world, um, who knows where that goes? Who knows where that goes when we start wearing, you know, when Apple or Google bring out their next set of fancy visual glasses and you start seeing art everywhere. I don't know. Uh, What does that look like? It's super interesting as well, like that a lot of street art, like if you talk about Invader or Obey or, sorry, Shepherd Fairy with the Obey stuff, it includes a lot of repetition, um, probably more so than other art. Um, And... The f- it's almost like it's sim- it's symbolism, but it, it to me that um, it really shows like how many times, say, invaders gone and stuck something on something with no other meaning than just he wanted to go out and put that thing out there, you know. And that is like you just have to want to do that. There's no that's probably being as obsessive as Thierry, you know. Um, there is no gain from that maybe for a very, very long time. You can't be doing that because you want to become rich and famous or something. You're just doing that because that's something you love doing. Uh, It's an expression for you and that's something to like remember I think is a takeaway from this little insight into the street art world is like you just, just do something for... Because you like it. And if you do it long enough, something good might happen, which is a bonus. Absolutely. But it probably won't. So just enjoy it anyway. You know. Yeah. I think I think a big one is to <laughs> I I, w- I wanted to um get into musical instruments again. But then I realized I just don't enjoy practice practicing them. So um I think I'm going to shift into what I probably do enjoy more, which is a bit of music production as an example. So it's like you could force yourself through some pain and then maybe it might get better. But there might be things that you just genuinely uh, just are drawn to and enjoy doing. And so um, those are probably the hobbies that um, you, know, you should tickle your fancy a little bit with. Yeah, do you just want to do this anyway? Yeah, that's a great thing. Um, so I'm going to hit you up with a closing quote because, uh, you know, nice crisp episode. This is from Mr. Brainwash himself, Thierry. Oh, here we go. Here's, here's something to twist the mind at the end of the day. I don't know how to play chess, but to me, life is like a game of chess. 
the big strategist in hiding. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> That's great. I love that. Kind of subs him up, I reckon. Yeah. I love it, mate. The, 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 the most distorted guy in the world has come out with the most orderly thing. Uh, I love it, mate. Cheers. This has been good. Cheers. See ya.